All right. Um, hi, I'm Adam Roberts. I uh, work on the Magenta project uh, at Google as part of the Google AI team. Um, and the title of my talk is Exploring the, the Creative Potential of Machine Learning Through the Magenta Project. Um, we're, we're a pretty small group. We're about like five or six researchers and then a few um, others that, that come and go. Um, but we're, we're an open source research project, so everything we do uh, goes online pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and we're exploring the role of machine learning in the creative process. So, um, so what does that mean? Well, it means both doing like fundamental machine learning research, uh, you know, publishing academic papers and going to those types of conferences, but also really importantly, um, it means interfacing with the creative community. So actually talking to mu musicians and other types of artists and seeing how the things that we're, we're developing in the, the research space might be useful to them um, in, the, in the creative space. Um, so I'm gonna cover a lot of content in this talk, but I, I wanna give like a gentle introduction first to machine learning and then talk a bit about a specific type of machine learning, which are, are called generative models. Um, and then lastly, kind of talk about how we can use these types of models uh, as, as uh, tools for creativity. So first, machine learning. Um, I, hopefully you all are familiar with the concept of algorithms, um, or you probably wouldn't have come to a, a con conference with that in the title. But um, algorithms, you know, they're, they're like a set of rules that you would follow to solve some problem, and they're traditionally implemented as like a concrete function, so a function that that just does the same thing every time you give it a, a certain input. So you know, you, you, you've seen this in, in math classes you know, in, in middle school and high school where you have y equals f of x, so x is our input. Um, we give that to the f function and it returns some value y. Um, so let's just write some simple functions. If you wanted to write a function to double a number, um, so that for example, if you put in an eight, you get a 16, or if you put in a 24, you get a 48. I think all of us would know how to do that. It's um, pretty simply two times x, right? Um, so this is kind of the traditional way of thinking about a function as, as, as a kind of concrete rule that you can apply to some input to get an output. Um, here's a slightly more complicated function. Uh, if I wanted to be able to you know, give, give um, a function two points and say, you know, get me from here to there and, and the shortest way possible. And we do this you know, pretty much every day in Google Maps, for example. Um, and this might not seem at first to be something that's a function, but it is, right? It's just an algorithm that solves this, this problem for you. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not super obvious what the way you would do it, but there is an algorithm you can write down and, and you, you learn this in, in undergrad computer science, um, what this algorithm is, it's called Bellman Ford. And so you follow these certain steps and it's guaranteed to give you the, the path from point A to point B, given some map um, in the shortest um, distance possible. So these are, you know, another example of a very concrete function. So now, how about this question? Um, so I, give, I want to be able to give a function a picture of either a cat or a dog, and I want it to tell me that that's a cat or that's a dog. And this is something that like any toddler can do, right? This is a very simple problem for humans to solve. But if I asked you to write, write me a function for that, you know, where would you even start? So you, you're given some pixels. How do you take those pixels and turn them into you know, either cat or dog? It's not, it's not a very obvious um, solution to that. Um, and, and you know, people have tried, you know, this has been a problem people have wanted to solve forever, and the traditional methods um, have always really failed pretty badly. So this is where machine learning comes in. And this is why you're seeing huge advances in this space, is because this new type of technique, um, you know, it's not totally new, but the kind of, the methods of achieving it are new, where you, you, instead of trying to write down some set of rules, you let the machine figure out its own rules. And, and they're very fuzzy rules that it'll figure out, but you let it, you give it a bunch of examples, you give it some pictures of cats and some pictures of dogs, and you tell them these are cats and these are dogs, and, and you know, after it's had a, had a chance to look at these for a long time, you can actually figure out its own set of rules that, that generally solves this problem pretty well. Um, so we're gonna represent in this talk these functions, these machine learning functions as kind of this trapezoidal shape, um, F, and uh, we, here we have you know, the dog as our input, and we want this function to tell us whether it's a cat or a dog, and at first, it has no idea, this is, we're give, it has no information at this point, so it's just gonna make a guess, and maybe it says cat with you know, a lot of uncertainty, and we say, no, that's not a cat, that's actually a dog. Um, and so this is useful information to this uh, machine learning model. It can now update its, its kind of internal set of rules to help it do better next time. So maybe we show it a picture of, of this cat, and by the way, I chose a kind of an ugly looking cat because I'm, I'm a dog fan, and I want us to kind of move away from the, uh, Monica's gonna disagree in her talk, but. Um, um, so this, it might guess, and maybe it guesses right. It says this is a cat, and we're like, yeah, that's right. Um, good job, and, and it'll kind of take in, in that bit of information as well. And if you, if you do this with, any, you know, with, a, with a child, they can, even if it's something they've never seen before, they can pretty quickly generalize to like a new animal 
and say that's also a, a cat, but it's just in a, you know it's maybe turned the other direction. Whereas a machine learning model won't get that immediately. You have to show it many, many examples and even millions sometimes before it can actually generalize to where you give it you know a picture of, of of a dog that maybe doesn't even look like a dog and maybe it's even disguising itself. But eventually the model becomes very confident. Yeah, I know you're trying to trick me, but that's a dog. Um, and so we say, yeah, great job. You you've now graduated and you can go off and like do some job for us and we can. Um, use you to categorize pictures in the future. So once the training's done, you kind of freeze the model and you send it off to do to do something useful for you. Um, so just a, one of the things I want to talk about in this talk is like how amazing the progress has been in this space in, in very recent years. So this is ImageNet accuracy, which ImageNet is kind of the benchmark for doing this type of um, classification on on images of of what what's in the images. And you can see the the blue dots are kind of tradi traditional. Um, um, computer vision, which does, it, it usually involves some machine learning, but not a lot, and there's a lot of hand-tuned features, a lot of people trying to write concrete rules. Um, and you can see in the last few years where deep learning has taken over, the accuracies have gone just up like crazy, and um, even in more recent time, it's now beyond the, it's, they're actually better at, these models are better at classifying things than humans are, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, so, so why has there been this progress? Part of it is like new concepts, new ideas, like deep artificial neural networks, which you've probably heard of, um, different methods for actually training these models, the compute power, so people figured out how to, how to use graphical processing units, which were originally invented for um, video gamers, to actually repurpose those to, to solve these problems for us really rapidly. And then now there's these custom chips like TPUs that are being developed at Google that are specifically made to make very rapid, um, um, make machine learning models run very rapidly. And lastly, which, and it's very important as well, is, is data, just the huge data sets we have now in digital format that we can train on. All right, so that's machine learning in a nutshell. Um, but I, what I haven't shown you is anything that's really related to creativity. So these, these, the models I showed you are, are called discriminative, meaning they can, um, you can give them something and they can discriminate something about it. They can tell you something about the input. But what about generative models? So these are models that instead can actually um, generate or create something from, from nothing. So let's look into a few uh, of this, this type of model, which I think is gonna be particularly interesting to us. Um, the first type is, is language models. So these are models that um, are, again, they're still just a function. In this case, I'm gonna call the function G for generative instead of F. Um, and this, the language models in particular are trying to do what's called next step prediction. So I can give it an input like what word comes, and it's going to try to predict what comes next, right? So, what word comes next would be a good choice, actually, in this, in this sentence. And you just train it the same way we train the other, mo the other models where you feed it a bunch of sentences, but you leave off you know, the last word and you have it guess the, the word, and if it gets it right, you, you know, do the same type of thing we did before. Um, but you can also just start from scratch, or maybe from like a, a small seed. So I can feed uh, just like the word I into this model, and it might guess, okay, maybe you wanna say am next. I am a language model, right? So this, this model can actually, um, just from, from one word, can actually generate a full sentence and it could keep going and generate a whole book if you wanted it to. I um, mean, you've, you've probably experienced these types of models on your phone where it's trying to, it'll actually kind of auto add, you know, what, what's the next word you might be typing um, is, is using these, this type of language model. So let's look at examples of this. Um, this is from 2013. So this was state of the art in 2013. Um, where Alex Graves trained uh, an L what's called an LSTM model on Wikipedia, and I've removed all of the, this thing also produced wiki markup, which is kind of amazing. So what, one thing I wanna point out before you start like reading this is just the fact that it even spells words correctly is amazing because it's, it's actually outputting a single character at a time. Before I was showing you outputting a single word, but this was actually outputting just a single character. You can see that just from, you know, looking from far away, it's got capitalization, it's got punctuation, the open parentheses always have a closed parentheses, so that, that fact is already pretty amazing. But if you start actually looking into the details of it, while it, from again, from afar, it looks like something you might see in Wikipedia, if you read the actual sentences, which from your laughter, I've, I guess you, some of you already have, um, it doesn't really make much sense. But again, this is 2013 state of the art. Um, and now, this is a little bit harder to read just because of the size, but, and this is only a portion of it, but this is the most recent um, I think th this is the best language model out there from, from OpenAI that just came out maybe a month ago. Um, and so I actually wanna read a little bit of this. Um, they, gave it, they gave it this input to start with. So in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. 
Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that unicorns spoke perfect English. So they gave it a totally ridiculous prompt, just specifically because they wanted it to not actually have anything in the training set that it could just pull from, right? And let's look at what it made up. I'm gonna skip, you should definitely read the whole thing on your own time, but um, this section's kind of interesting. So it talks about this Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and several companions were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley um, with no other animals than humans, and skip around just a little bit. Um, Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language or something like a dialect or dialectic. So, I mean, this is just amazing. And I, again, I highly recommend you go to the webpage and click on the example where they had, they prompted it with like a, a high school um, essay prompt and it wrote like an entire essay on, I can't remember what the topic was, but it, it's kind of, a, it's just incredible. So, so again, a lot of progress in a few years. And now I wanna switch to kind of what we work on in Magenta, which is mostly music. Um, so we can do the same type of trick with music. We can feed in notes as our, instead of a sentence and have it, you know, we'll give it a few notes and have it predict what might be the next note. And the same way that we were writing sentences and paragraphs, we can write an entire piece of music by just feeding in the notes one at a time, getting the prediction and feeding that back in um, as the input. Um, so this is, again, in the spirit of like showing the progress, this is from 2016. Um, the first model we trained that we were like, we were happy enough with that we, we kind of put it out to the world. So I wanna play just a very short example. Um, this was primed with the first three notes of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So you'll hear those notes and then you'll hear how the model continued it. Um, one thing to point out is the model is not generating the audio. The audio is just like somebody just threw it into GarageBand or whatever. So judge it more on the notes than that. All right. <laughs> So it's, it's got a little bit of structure to it. It sound, it's kind of catchy if you listen to it a million times like I have. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's pretty simple. But still, like, we were pretty excited about it, and we put it, you know, we put it on a blog. And of course, the press was like, Google's AI is making music. You know, it wrote its first song. And there was this like, huge press craziness around it. But it's, it's kind of like in hindsight, it's like, wow, that's ridiculous. OK, so let's, um, let's fast forward to today. So this is kind of a, the most recent example of of the, the improvements in our language models. This is work from Anna Wong, um, who's an AI resident, um, and she also is partly responsible, like or majorly responsible for the doodle, that, the Bach doodle that's on the webpage today. Um, so this is an example of a piece of piano music that, that um, her model generated. And again, this is just, just like the OpenAI thing, I really encourage you to go to the blog post and listen to the other examples. Um, so let's listen to this little 30 second clip here. So there's, <laughs> again, you should definitely listen to the others if you thought that was good. Um, so it's pretty, pretty impressive stuff. Um, so okay, I wanna move on from language models and talk a little bit about another type of generative model called an autoencoder. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit of the details here, but don't worry if you don't fully understand everything. I, I'll show you some pretty pictures afterwards. But uh, the idea is now, instead of having one model, one function, we have two functions. The first we'll call f, which is our encoder function. And what it does is it takes in, in this case, a little sketch of a cat face, um, and it turns that into just a sequence of numbers, a vector of numbers that um, we typically denote z. So for now, you can just think of this as like, okay, this function just turns that into some numbers, that's fine. Um, but now we have a second function, g, which is our decoder, and it takes in that, that um, vector of numbers and tries to turn that back into the cat face. So visually, we can see it like this. We have our f, which takes our cat face, turns it into z, and z turns it back into the cat face. What's really important here, though, is that, as you can see by the shape of this, the z is much, much smaller in its information content than the cat face is on either side. So the model is having to figure out what is the most important information that I need to pass to the decoder for it to be able to recreate this. So there's a huge information loss, but, it's, but by training it, you're able, it's able to kind of learn the general 
rules about human sketches, and so it only needs to fill in the most important details. Um, so this is great because you can play fun games with it. Uh, this is work from uh, David Ha and Douglas Eck uh, at Magenta. And one example of what you can do is you can take the generator, so the, the decoder, and instead of putting one of the Zs in it that you get from the encoder, you just put a random set of numbers in, and it'll spit out a doodle that looks like something a person might have drawn, but really none of these were drawn by people. These were all just drawn by um, this model that's kind of learned what human sketches kind of look like. Um, and you know, every time you roll the, roll the die, you get something different. Um, this was trained, the model itself was trained on millions of, of doodles um, drawn by people. Um, so you can also do this, this other really fun game where you um, do, do kind of like a morphing or an interpolation where you can take two human inputs, you can feed them into the encoder and you get uh, Z values for each of those. So you get a cat Z and a pig Z. Um, and then on the other side what we're doing is on the left we're just gonna pass the Z for the, the cat in to the generator, to the decoder, and we should get something that looks just like the cat. On the other side, we'll do the same with the pig. But in the middle, what we'll do is we'll mix these together, because these are just, these Zs are just numbers, right? So in the very center, we'll just average the numbers together, and then we'll kind of mix them proportionally based on where we are on this line. And what you end up with is you get a bunch of sketches that it's like a slow morphing from the cat's face over to the pig's, the pig's body, and you know, you can see how you know, the tail kind of curls up, uh, all, all sorts of little, little steps happen that makes this a very smooth morphing. And again, none of these outputs were ever seen by the model. They're not actually drawn by people, they're drawn by the model. Um, you can also play fun games with arithmetic, again, because these are just numbers. So we can take like a cat face plus a pig body minus the pig face. And so what do you think you get? Anybody? The cat, the cat body, right? Um, and then the same thing down here, we can do the opposite basically and get a pig face. Um, and this just works, which is, so the model has really learned, it, the, these Z values are really important. They're like a representation that is actually very meaningful. Um, and so that's gonna be interesting when we talk about how we can use these for creative um, purposes. Uh, so the, now the example in the music space, this is some work that I did a couple years ago um, on, called Music VAE. So it's very similar to what we just saw for the cats and the pigs, but now we're applying that to music. So in this example I want to play, it's, it's a little bit long, but I, um, it's, 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 it's important that we, we hear the whole thing. You'll, you'll hear it start with one melody, and then you'll hear it go to a very different melody in the same way we went from the cat to the pig, and you'll hear the slow progression as the music changes to try to get from point A to point B. So first we'll hear um, melody A. And then here, next is melody B where we want to end up. Now we're going to start with A and morph it to B. So whenever, whenever you heard, uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll pause. Um, so whenever you heard the original two, right, they're, they're very distinct, but, um, but the, the, the transition was smooth, and very importantly, it's not just like picking notes from either end. A lot of the, most of the notes in the middle weren't even present in either end, right? So it's actually doing something different in the middle. And we have this for drums as well. Um, if you go to this link, you can hear a lot of examples. Um, so we can also do this game where we just give it a random set of numbers and let it come up with its own thing. I'm gonna show you an example of that for actually for trios where we've trained it on three instruments playing together. Um, again, don't judge the production because this is, I barely know GarageBand, but um, listen to how the in instruments are playing with each other uh, on this piece that was made up by the model.
So every time you roll the die, again, you get something different, you'll get different genres. Um, and, and you know, like they don't all sound amazing, but like one out of five is, is pretty darn good. So um, you can also do the arithmetic. I don't have time to go into this, but you can add different vectors to kind of move music through the space. Um, but I want to switch now to the last generative model we're going to talk about, which is probably the one most of, most of you who are familiar with this space know about, which are GANs. Um, and that stands for Generative Adversarial Network. Um, and this also has two functions. The first function, G, is the generator. So you give it a random set of numbers, like our Z that we saw before, um, and you, it, it tries to come up with you know, something that looks like the data you give it. So in this case, we want to train it on people's faces. So it'll try to come up with something like a, that looks like a person's face, and then the second part of the model, the second function, takes that output and tries to decide whether that's a real human face or it's something that the other model came up with. Right, so they're, they're, there's, they're kind of adversarial in that way. Um, another way to visualize it is like this, where you have the Z, the generator turns the Z into a picture, the F tries to decide whether that's real or fake. Um, and the way this is trained, um, you know, mostly we only really care about the G, but the F is actually very important to actually train the G. So at first, the, Z is, uh, the G is just generating like random pixels, and the F has no problem at all figuring out these random pixels are not real faces. Um, but the G will then learn how to fool F, right? So it's, we're playing them off each other. G will figure out, okay, wh what is F looking at? It can actually look inside of F and see what is, how is it figuring out that I'm doing something wrong, and it can um, compensate for that, and so it gets a little better at it. And then you switch it, so once G is fooling F again, you switch it and have F figure out, okay, how is G fooling me? And you keep going back and forth many, many times until eventually you get something a generator that can produce realistic looking examples. So let's look at the original work on this from a few years ago. The faces at the top, none of those are real faces. Um, and on the bottom, does anybody know what these are supposed to look like? On the bottom? What's that? Sort of, yeah. It's like, so they're supposed to look like bedrooms, basically. Um, and you can kind of see like things that look kind of like beds. Uh, honestly, when this came out in 2015, we were freaking out about how amazing this was. That this, like you could squint at this and it looked like bedrooms. Um, but let's look at now the, the progress that's been made. So that face I was showing you before is not a real face. These are all made up faces by um, a model that came out recently from NVIDIA. Um, so every one of these is totally fake. Um, it's called StyleGAN, by the way. And now we can see also this is what the bedrooms look like. So none of these are real bedrooms. <laughs> um, sure. There's even a website, I don't remember exactly what the URL is, where you can, uh, yeah, this face does not exist, where you just refresh it and it, it just generates a new face every time. Um, that's totally fake. All right, so I think, we'll, so again, going to the space of creativity that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later, it's very cool that you can do this, but like, you know, that's kind of fun, but what can you use it for? Well, one interesting thing you can do is apply some human control to it, just like we were doing the interpolations with music and with the sketches, we can do something similar here. It's not quite as easy with GANs, but what I'm showing you here is on the top row, um, there are some you know, made-up faces from the model, and on the left column, there's some other made-up faces. In the middle, we're combining those, the attributes of those faces. So if you focus on the boy, it's a little bit easier. So this, there's some Z that represents this boy, and then on the left, there's some Z that represents each of these faces. And if you mix the Zs together, you get that column of, of the boy, you can see how he changes as you apply the attributes from the other face. So these are all made up, but you're actually able to control a bit how it, how it develops these faces. So that's pretty cool. Um, so now how have we used this in, in Magenta? Um, again, we focus mostly on music, so what we've done recently is work called GANSynth by Jesse Engel and others that takes, um, instead of generating faces, we try to generate um, music, but not, not musical notes, actually musical audio. So we're trying to generate new instruments, essentially, where we, we have our generator generate the sound of an instrument playing a note, and the discriminator is trying to figure out, is that a real instrument, or is that something the generator made up? Um, and through this process, eventually you get, you get sounds that sound a lot like instruments that we know about, but then it also kind of invents new instruments in the spaces between them. So I want to play an example where, where you're going to hear a song that you're familiar with, um, and the, um, or I'm assuming you're familiar with, but then the, the GAN is going to be generating the actual audio that is playing the notes. And what you'll hear is the audio, will, the timbre will kind of change as it moves through this instrument space. And sometimes you'll recognize the instrument and sometimes in between, it'll, it'll be like a new made up instrument. So let's hear this example. <laughs>
goes on for a while, but you can imagine there's like in infinite instruments that it can kind of come up with. Um, so that's generative models. Um, again, it's just a small subset of the things we've been working on. And lastly, I want to talk about how what this means for creativity. So as I mentioned before, like it's kind of cool that these can generate things, but is that creative or not? You know, this is a question that I kind of don't even like considering because I, I think what's the more interesting question is not are these things creative themselves, but how can we use them as a tool for to enhance human creativity? Um, and so I'm going to talk about two areas that we we've worked on in this space. The first is for musicians, creating uh, tools for them and for producers to, to use to make music. Um, and the first example that um, it's probably the most well-known of our work is, is called Insynth Super, which uses a model very similar to what I just showed you with you know, moving through the instrument timbre space. Um, but it's been put into like a little box by a team at, at Google called Creative Lab um, to make an instrument. And I want to play just a few clips of, of this video. So what's happening is as the little dot's moving around, it sounds more like the instrument that it's closest to, but in the middle, it's kind of mixing together their, their timbres. You can use this to make some really unique sounds. You can turn the little knobs in the corners to change which instruments are on the corner. Um, and you can even invent your own sounds by uploading them. Um, we have like a web portal where you can kind of run your own sounds through the model. Um, so we've given that version to some, some musicians and they're, they're working on various projects that um, will hopefully be coming out soon. But we also have made a version, a DIY version that you can build yourself um, with kind of standard DIY parts. Um, it has the exact same functionality, just in a much cheaper box. Um, so if you're interested, you could download the instructions and make it yourself. We also have a, a project we released recently called Magenta Studio, which is a set of plugins for Ableton Live that provide various functionality using some of the models I talked about earlier. Um, they also work as standalone apps, but the, you know, the intention is for them to be used typically with, with the DAW like Ableton. And um, there's four I'm showing here out of the five, but first one is Continue, which you can take some melody or some drum beat that you've come up with and have the model continue it with a language model. Um, on the right is Interpolate, which does the kind of, when I showed you the morphing between the melodies, it does that same thing um, with, with your own input. And then I want to focus on the middle two, um, First Groove, which is a little bit different. So one function that producers really want to have is the ability to take like a quantized drum beat that they put into a sequencer and make, turn it into something that sounds like what, a, what an actual drummer would play. Because you know, something that's not just fixed to the 16th notes um, and that has some feeling to it. And um, there's a lot of humanization, is what they're called, uh, plugins out there that just kind of randomly jitter the notes and kind of make it seem like it's, it's not so robotic. Um, but what we did is we, we, we approached this problem a different way. We paid some professional drummers to come in and record them playing on a MIDI drum kit and capture that MIDI information. And then it's very easy to take human drumming and convert it into a quantized um, drum pattern just by like fixing the notes to the grid and removing the velocities. And then we trained a model to try to go from that quantized version back to what the drum drummer actually played. So again, we have a function that takes quantized drum notes into human drum performances. Oh, that's great. Um, somebody's trying to contact me. So, um, so let's see what this looks like in practice. So this is just a quantized drum beat. You can hear it's very robotic. And now we're going to run it through Groove. So it's got a lot more feeling. Um, it actually sounds like what a, what a person might play. We can take this one step further with Drumify, where we um, flatten it not just to a quantized drum beat, but just to a rhythm. And a rhythm is something you can extract from anything. You can extract a rhythm from a melody or from a bass line just by using the onsets. So here's an example where we take Drumify and we, we play, somebody's playing just like an electric bass, recording it, getting the onsets, and then feeding it into the model. And it's going to come up with a drum beat to play along with, with that bass line. All right, so now he's going to um, get the onsets in Ableton and then feed it through Drumify. 
So, um, so again, these, these plugins, and those are just, I just showed you a couple of them, you should explore them all if you're interested, are totally free to download, and all the code's open source if you wanna expand on it yourself. Um, <laughs> okay, so that was creativity for tools, uh, tools for musicians. And as we were doing this, like I just said, everything's open source, so we, we developed a bunch of libraries to make this possible, both in Python, where we're training most of the models, as well as in JavaScript, where we're building like these plugins and other things like that. So we open sourced all that code, and, and actually, this is kind of unintentional somewhat, but these also became tools themselves for, for creative coders um, to build their own, own types of applications on top of it that, were, that themselves are creative, right? So, for example, I showed you earlier where I was sampling you know, the trio of the drums, bass, and, and, and uh, keyboard playing together. With just these three lines of code, you can do that yourself in the browser. Um, it's built with TensorFlow.js, which, uh, which gives it web GL acceleration, which makes it run fast enough. Um, and so here's something I built. I am not a, as you can tell, I am not an expert at HTML. I, knew, I know a deprecated um, function called marquee, um, but I, I was able to build this kind of fun app, or I think it's fun, Let's just, and we're gonna, we're gonna test it here. So this is gonna do exactly what I was just saying. It's gonna sample a random um, three-part, you know, random trio and play it back for us. It uses like five lines of JavaScript to do that. Um, and it, there's a lot of uh, variability here, so let's see how, how this sounds. I'm gonna turn it down. That one's pretty creepy. Let's, let's uh, speed it up. So we can just do this forever. Here's another one. and I encourage you to do so. Um, so people that are much more talented than me have taken this, this API and built really cool things with it. Uh, Catherine McCurry built this, this dance floor at, for Sonar uh, this past year that you can walk around on, and as you're walking around, it's um, moving through this, this latent Z space of, of um, musical melodies. I don't know why that's down there, but okay, I'm not gonna touch it. So uh, there's also this really prolific guy named Taro. He's a developer in Finland who's made all sorts of really amazing applications built on, on these libraries, including things that are actually useful tools for musicians, as well as just fun, fun games and, and other sort of art pieces. I wanna show one in particular that just has no purpose aside from being like a creative, uh, a creative piece of art. Um, and this is called Bubble Bath. So what you do is you just kind of click around. And depending on where you click, it'll kind of build a new melody using one of our APIs. You can click somewhere else and get a different melody. And then they'll slowly kind of morph towards each other using the music VAE space. work. So <laughs> you'll see lots more examples of this in the next talk, actually, uh, which is Monica's talk. Um, but also, there's a bunch of demos on our website. And you know, feel free to make your own and tell us about it, and we'll put it up there as well. And that's all I have time for. I probably have less time than I need. <laughs> Thanks. Is there, are there time for questions? Or? OK. Uh, my question relates to your auto encoder portion of the talk uh, that morphs between two melodies. So if I was going to think of doing that as a human in the most traditional music theory sense, if I have melody A and melody B, mm -hmm. I not only think about the kind of least number of notes that I need to morph between them, but also the chord progression sort of that each one belongs to and what chord progression kind of my intermediary stuff should be in the middle to morph between those two. My question is, does your autoencoder have any sort of underlying state space model that keeps track of a thing like chord progression and the probability of moving from one chord to so, another? Good question. So th th with all these models, like the only information we're showing it is just melodies, right? So if it learns about chord progressions and things like that, that's something that's figuring out itself, which I think is a really interesting part of these models. Like pr previously, a lot of work on generative music 
Um, you know, it me means starting with some music theory rules and having the model or having the algorithm like follow those rules to produce something. Whereas this, you know, it it learns the rules very imperfectly, which I think is fun because it breaks them a lot. And sometimes when it, sometimes it breaks them, it's like, oh, that's terrible. But other times it actually does it in some really clever way that you might not have expected. Um, so my answer is like, if you do this a bunch of times, you'll probably get some that follow, do what you might do, but many times you'll get things that, that are totally unexpected, and some, some fraction of those times you'll actually be pleased with what it does, right? So um, it's, I think it's an interesting question that really re requires somebody who, I, so I personally, I actually am not an expert in, in music theory and stuff, so it's been fun hearing people's reaction, because some people are really hardcore into music theory, are like, oh, this is terrible, it did not do, what I wanted in others, we get a lot of other feedback that's like, this did something totally different than what I would have done, but I love it. So your mileage may vary and you're depending also on your perspectives, I guess. Uh, in the uh, drum sequence humanizer, uh, did you make any attempt or did anyone make an attempt to understand what is it that makes it human? <laughs> I mean, so I mean, what we, so what we're, so first of all, we did not come up with the name humanizer. This is like a existing kind of function, but what, so if you think about what those, the um, existing things actually do, all they're doing is taking a drum beat that is just fixed to 16th notes and, and making them so they either start slightly before the beat or slightly after, adding some accents so that every drum is not being hit with the exact same intensity. Um, so I think that's when, I think compared to what a drum machine originally was able to do, which was again, just same velocity, fixed to 16th notes were as fine grained as you could go, the fact that you could just add that those types of discrepancies were enough to make it feel more human. I think, I think your question is good because ours is you know, kind of doing probably a bit more, um, but no, I don't think we've actually have, set, has, have done that, that type of analysis. I think it'd be interesting to talk. Um, one of our, we just, this is very recent work by the way, but we wanna go back actually to the drummers that performed and see, for example, like, does, can you tell who, you know, which of the drummers this was most influenced by? Because it's, it's learning from what they did, right? And they all played different types of styles um, and they all have their own personal style. So assuming, I'm assuming that it probably picked up on a little bit of that as well. And by the way, the data set that we use to generate that is also going to be open source very soon. So you can actually hear um, the data we use as well as train your own models on that data. So one of the things that you're looking at doing is trying to uh, see how machine learning could be applied as tools for artists. And I'm wondering if you looked at the edit space as a possible application for that anywhere in the Magenta team. What do you in, mean by that? Uh, somewhat similar to the way you have like predictive next word for uh, a series of words. Maybe it's the predictive next brush stroke of a canvas. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the the sketch model kind of does that. I didn't talk about this, but it actually is trained not just on like a flat pixels of an image, but actually the strokes. So the data, it's actually doing a sequence of strokes. So that's getting sort of towards what you're talking about. Um, I think what the, the main prohibitor for doing things like this are knowing, um, actually having the data. Like if, if you recorded a bunch of artists, every step they were taking, you could then try to mimic those and then, um, then maybe add some control on top of that, which would make it more interesting. But we don't, like a lot of people ask, for example, like I wanna, I wanna automatically do some, learn how I'm doing things in Ableton and kind of repeat those tasks um, and kind of predict that. But we don't, have, we don't have a recording of a bunch of people doing that, whereas we do have a bunch of musical scores that we can train off of. Um, there was some related work to, to what you were talking about from DeepMind where they actually had a model, they, they gave it control over a paints program and they gave it some pictures and they had it try to figure out how can it control this painting program to actually um, create this, this resulting image. Um, but they just had to learn it from scratch. Like it had no examples of people actually using the program. So it did really weird things to make, like if you watch this process, it's completely strange and like it has so many wasted things that it does, but it ultimately can produce an output like you give it. And they hooked it up, I think, to like an actual robot arm and had it paint a picture in this really weird way. Um, so it's interesting to see if you just give it the end result and let it figure out its own process, it does some really odd things. But if you actually had recordings of real people's processes, then it could learn from that a little bit better. Yeah, it's called Spiral, if you want to look it up. I'm just wondering about the ethical implications of training machines to invent faces, and in a way, the ethical implication for artists to have machines that can make human fooling music and art I understand that some of them 
are used for tools so that the humans take it back. Mm -hmm. um, but other humans will simply, what, be overridden? I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's, that's an and excellent question. Does Google question. have a team that deals with that? Yeah, so there is, um, there is a group called the Ethical AI Group that thinks about these questions all the time, and they're doing a lot of work um, writing papers in this space as well. And, and also anything that any team at Google does like has to go through these, these processes to kind of consider those, those ideas. Um, I think for the faces thing, it kind of started just as like, this isn't, we have a big data set of people's faces, so it's, and, and I'm not talking about Google specifically, this is a public data set. So that was the natural thing people started with. And I, I do think that the, there are huge, like, and what is the use? Like, why is it useful to be able to generate a bunch of faces? I don't know, it's kind of cool. Um, so that's kind of why our team is more focused on actually making usable things out of it. Um, the, there, there was the, the work I showed where the, the text generator from OpenAI, what they actually did, this is, they made a big um, statement when they released that, they did not release the model and they said it was because of ethical concerns um, about the fact that you, for example, could have people writing essays um, with it. You know, like there's all sorts of weird, or fake news, you could generate fake news stories with it. So those are huge ethical concerns around it and I think um, the conversation is just starting to happen around what are gonna be the implications of this. As far as like displacement of artists, um, I mean the typical, the way I think about it is, is is very similar to you know whenever drum machines came out originally or photography and people were worried that would displace um, painters <laughs> or you know the drum machine would displace drummers but really what it did and, and like first of all those things are still around they're still painters they just kind of moved to a different type style they invented new styles that maybe weren't as easy to mimic with photography um, and photography itself became an art and using a drum machine became an art so I think I don't think it's going to limit things. I actually think it's going to increase opportunity for, for creativity. Uh, time for one last quick question here. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, have you experimented with style transfer the way we did for images, for music, like to come up for two different genre? And another thing is, is there any plan from Google to release uh, like music embeddings, like how do you have for word to vec or even BERT? Like, can we use it for like other purposes? Yeah, okay, so I'll answer the second part first, just because, so the music VAE model that I was showing, it produces embeddings, and that model is open source, so you can get embeddings out of it. They probably won't be quite as useful as, as word to vec just because of the, you know, the nature of music data, it's, it's much more varied. Um, but that is out there, and there are people exploring different projects with using those embeddings to train other models, for example. Um, so the first question was, so, sorry, can you actually remind uh, me now? Style transfer. Style transfer, yeah. So this is something that people, I think we get asked every time. It, that's, that's actually much harder to do for music um, than you would think. We've, we have tried it. Music VAE can kind of do that where you can, I was talking, I kind of skipped over it, but you can do this attribute arithmetic where you can take the embedding for one song and move it to like the space of another genre and it actually kind of does the right thing. But the problem is we don't have a lot of data where we know the genre of the songs to begin with. So we have a very, a very small subset of the data we have has genre labels that then we can use to train this other model on. I think if we had a lot more data, then it would definitely be possible, but yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Yep. Um, Thank you. Good time. Uh,